to you. I talked about a deep <coughs> crisis, uh, a word you don't want to throw around uh, lightly here. Just what's your sense of the magnitude of what's happened here over the last 24 hours? You know, it's amazing to think that taken in isolation, any one of these things, the firing of James Comey, the emergence of intelligence information that had been inappropriate, sh appropriately shared, and then this bombshell development uh, yesterday as well would be almost impossible for a White House to get traction, to get back on the front for it to regroup. Together, we're dealing with a deepening crisis, even Republicans saying publicly and privately that the White House is in a spiral, that they cannot seem to get out of much of it of their own making, much of it now also bolstered by the way he has treated, uh, obviously, James Comey, the former FBI director, roping in other people, damp really, really damaging the fundamental credibility of the communications that are coming out of their, of their direction. But it is a White House that is rudderless and one that is simply not going to be able to get beyond this until either more information is shared, more transparency is shared, or they can have any sort of positive news event to disrupt the cycle that we're in. Chris, we're not getting a whole lot here on the record from the White House. What are we hearing from the Department of Justice uh, about reports here of the existence of this memo? Well, that Trump picked the fight with the wrong group. Uh, essentially, the FBI is, uh, you know, fighting back on this and Comey is fighting back on this. Uh, you know, in and of itself, this memo um, that Comey wrote, uh, you know, raises the question of whether there was obstruction of justice by the White House. And it's, it, the people that I'm talking to, the sources I'm talking to, look at it as just another piece in the puzzle. When you, when you aggregate the, the details that have come forward, it begins to paint more and more of a picture of, of a cover-up by Trump. Uh, you bring up obstruction of justice. Key to that is intent by the president. Explain the role that that plays here and what lawyers, lawmakers will be looking for. Well, the, the key is, is, you know, if Trump was intending to actually uh, uh, interfere or decapitate the uh, FBI's investigation into, uh, into uh, the collusion with, with Russia over the uh, 2016 election. And, uh, you know, the sources that I've been talking to have been saying that the idea that Trump, uh, you know, pulled Comey into a private meeting in the Oval Office and said, hey, can you just drop this? seemed to be more about wishful thinking uh, in the way that it was phrased. However, when you look at the additional details that we now know, that uh, two weeks before that, Trump had asked uh, Comey for his loyalty, mm -hmm. and then uh, Trump fired Comey, it begins to, you can, you can then begin to piece together what uh, lawyers could actually make a case for intent on Trump's part. Megan, what do we see in terms of response on Capitol Hill from uh, lawmakers? You don't have Republican lawmakers clamoring to comment on this, it seems, yet you do have the chairman of the House Oversight Committee uh, requesting records from the yeah. FBI, from the acting director, of any sort of interactions between uh, then-director James Comey and President Trump. But they're walking in an almost incredibly difficult type route to frankly stay on. Not even Barnum and Bailey acrobats could stay on what they're being <laughs> asked to do. We see Paul Ryan this morning very interestingly again saying he needs to see the facts standing in line so far in terms of what he knows. In fact, even though even to the extent of going on the offensive a little bit, which was interesting, we 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 will have to watch and see Republicans and how long they're going to maintain this. I think it's going to be very dependent on the next wave of information that we said. We know James Comey has this memo. He has many others. And Chris is exactly right when he hits on this point of aggregation. Taken in isolation, this memo, these moments that we've had would be significant, highly, highly significant and highly damaging, but perhaps not to the level of an obstruction. People talking about the word impeachment that they are banding about in mm. some places on Capitol Hill aggregating them, painting this picture going forward. Is it a blunder? Was it a, a unbelievably reckless blunder, such as leaking of intelligence, highly sensitive intelligence from Israel to our rivals, as has, to the Russians, as has yeah. been reported? Or are we starting to see the footsteps of something slightly more sinister? Chris is exactly right. Lawyers will be parsing it, parsing it down exactly for whether there was intent, obstruction is being used. And people are going to argue this both ways. But if the picture emerges that this is deeper and, and, and darker, then I think people then I, than a boy, than a, than a president who just simply cannot maintain discipline, then we're in for a, a, a several months of pain. Chris, help us understand the culture of writing memos within the Department of Justice, within the FBI. How out of the norm uh, is it for an FBI director to be doing this? And, and how does a document like that, when in fact we see it, how does that stand up in a court of law? Well, what, what I'm told is that uh, Comey actually has a history of doing this kind of activity where he is very, very careful, very meticulous in terms of documenting, especially activities that he feels, uh, you know, are improper. And so, um, you know, what I've been told is that he went back and 
basically, you know, made made notes after directly after the meeting, and then shared uh, those notes and what became known and what be, what became the memo with a small group of people uh, in the in the FBI leadership and some of his closest associates. It is common practice for FBI agents to. Uh, to record, to document uh, the uh, interactions that they have. And uh, those documents, uh, whether they're memos or, or other forms of documentation, are used in court. They're used in court on a regular basis. They're the notes of the FBI agents in order to, in order to both, you know, defend their cases mm. and to, and, and, and to uh, you know, set the record straight. Megan, what changes uh, if and when we get this document? In other words, we have reporting that it exists. We've, we've heard or we've seen uh, transcripted excerpts from conversations in which parts of it are read, read aloud. Does the story change fundamentally if we see the thing itself? I don't think the story is going to change fundamentally. I think some of the, the right-wing pushback that we're seeing on the existence, there is, with, within the absence of the physical document, there's still the ability to discount the narrative. But look, you know, we have to look at the markets today as well and how they're reacting. You know, this is the first time we're seeing a little bit of a dawning reality that perhaps the legislative agenda, particularly in terms of tax reform, particularly in terms of deregulation, is likely to face some serious speed bumps in getting that done. You know, we're, we look at a case now where all of the attention every single day, every single 24-hour news cycle is dominated by a mistake, a blunder, a scandal, a deepening, deepening mm. scandal and crisis in the White House. There is no attention being focused on those legislative priorities that so many people want to see get through, whether it's health care reform, whether it's immigration reform, or it's certainly tax reform where they say they're going to focus their efforts. So they are, they are literally crippled until they can move out of the cycle of moving forward with anything that's fundamentally important to, to the Republican agenda much broader. And that really hurts them going into 2018 as well.